Yo, what is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Burnt Denim, the podcast where we spread knowledge and still passion and generate conversation. Once again, I am your co-host, Nick. And I am your other co-host, Max. And dude, Nick, how are you, man? I'm doing good. Yeah? Life is good. How are you? Life is good. Life, it's a crazy season with everything happening in the world, but <laughs> life's good, huh? Vid. Yeah. We love y'all. We hope you're all doing well. We really love our Burnt Denim fam, our loyal following. We love you guys. But yes, as Nick said, we are very excited to bring you this new episode. Um, it's another brand history. And today we're going to hop into a brand that if you are into fashion, you've probably heard of before. You probably know. If not, maybe not. I was talking to my fam. They had yeah. no idea who what this was. But there's a very interesting history and an influence behind this brand. And so, Nick, who are we talking about today? Yeah. So like you said, this person in this brand you may have heard before but you don't know anything in depth about it for the most part and it, that was that was the same for us so we're we're really excited to bring you this one because it was very <coughs> challenging for us to learn and dive yeah. dive deeper into the history yeah, so and we learned and gained a lot from this one yeah um so we're excited to teach you guys and share about the brand history behind rick owens rick owens and before nick hops in i just wanted to give a quick shout out to TikTok solely he's this youtuber and he does a lot of brand histories and he definitely helped you know us get some info on this so shout out to him so yeah sorry yeah shout out to google <laughs> always there for me yes um but yeah starting with the man himself rick owens he was born november 18th in 1962 which means he's like 58 today yeah um, yeah in Porterville, California, not too far from where we're based. I uh, know, baby. His mother was a school teacher and seamstress, and his dad was a social worker. Hmm. He grew up in a very traditional household, household and ended up going to a Catholic school growing up, and he actually like hated it. Really? Did not enjoy it. Yeah, um, I, I probably wouldn't enjoy it. Since he was in a very traditional and stricter household, he didn't get a TV till he was 16 hmm. uh, and found entertainment through... Uh, classical music, literature, um, all his parents' kind of music and books that they passed down to him. Yeah. Um, but outside of his home, he listened to a lot more of punk style music, like Kiss, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, those the kind goats. of those kind of that kind of music at the time, and really created like a rebellious attitude within him. Yeah. Uh, later on, when he was about fifteen, uh, he started to be introduced to fashion and got really interested, and. Although, as he was growing up, he was originally interested in like traditional art and paint uh, and went to the Otis College of Art and Design in L.A. to study to become a painter. Uh, he ended up dropping out because of the high cost of attendance and he didn't really see a future for himself as a painter. Mm. He then decided to go to Los Angeles Trade Technical College to study pattern making since he saw uh, job security in that trade and was interested in, in, uh, clothing and patterns. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the interesting things too, that you said is how he would listen to that classical music and yeah. stuff that his, his parents listened to, but then he also had, you know, that, that outside influence of like being rebellious. Yeah. I feel like that went on to kind of define his style. Right. You know? It's very rebellious, but structured yeah. in a way. Yeah. So that you can kind of see that in a lot of his designs to where it is traditional in a sense, but it's a modern rebellious take of, like, of the tradition. Of the tradition. Um, yeah. It goes so against... it's very, very influential in shaping who he is and his, his designs. Yeah. And I think that's why he is so influential. I mean, we're going to go on to talk about mm -hmm. it as, as a menswear designer, but is because he was able to take two, like that classical... Uh, fashion design with his kind of punk, you know, aesthetic and kind of meshed them into something that didn't really exist before right. this, what right. I would say. But yeah. Um, so as Nick said, um, he then after he studied this pattern making at this trade technical college, which I didn't know was something you could study at a trade yeah. school. Interesting. But yeah, he studied pattern making. He then went to uh, work making knockoff patterns for brands that stole different designs and mm. patterns such as uh, such as Versace designs and Gucci designs and he worked he did that for four years so he worked four years uh, helping this company basically rip off other people's making designs fakes for making the fakes making yeah. fakes Rick Owens made fakes and that's how he got experience yeah, I in guess pattern. it's one of those things where um, good art, good artists copy great artists steal something True. like that you have to learn to True. learn to I mean, replicate before you can create on your own yeah and, and during his time uh, learning to copy these patterns it allowed him to get hands-on, you know, experience with mm -hmm. fashion, with pattern making, and with clothing itself. So, although it may not be justified, <laughs> um, 
it, <laughs> it gave him experience in being able to work with clothing. And, yeah. and, and really, I feel like when you are able to copy something to perfection, you become so much more skilled in, in whatever it is. If you're able to exactly copy something, maybe you hear a song and you can exactly recreate it, mm-hmm. then it gives you experience to go on and eventually create your own. So yeah, so uh, he then, after he had done this pattern making for four years, uh, a woman named Michelle Lamy, very interesting name, Michelle yeah. Lamy, um, I found out about Rick Owens in 1988. Um, and she actually hired him as a pattern maker for her new sportswear venture. So she basically had opened up cafes. She was a restaurateur and artist, mm-hmm. and she also uh, started clothing lines. And so she was starting a new sportswear clothing line, found out about Rick Owens through a friend, and uh, hired him to become her pattern maker. Um, and then after two years of working, the, relation became, the relationship became intimate. Mm-hmm. And she's a lot older than him. I think she's about 20 years older than him, or... Somewhere around, around there. That, yeah. Yeah. So very, you know, usually I feel like it's the guy is old and the woman is younger, you know, yeah. just by what society is. But, but yeah, so their relation became intimate. Um, and I heard the reason it actually took so long is because he couldn't understand her thick French accent off the bat. Like I was watch, <laughs> watching this video and uh, yeah. because he's, you know, born and raised in California um, and she's French. And so he didn't really understand. It took a while for that barrier to be broken down between their the mm-hmm. conversations and so it became intimate and he actually describes her as his muse and all these different things and during this time they both used uh, drugs and drank alcohol heavily like they were mutually just caught up in really you know bad drug use and drug addiction and it almost killed Rick Owens on multiple occasions um, but then he stopped using drugs and he got sober in 1994 and he went on to start his own brand which we know today Rick Owens um, and at this time, Michelle Lamy shut down her clothing sports ed- endeavor that she was working on and actually went to work uh, back at the cafe that she had previously started uh, before her sportswear endeavor. Um, so at this time, Rick Owens and Michelle Lamy are still together. Um, but uh, he originally started his, his clothing line, Rick Owens, as a women's wear company, mm-hmm. which today it's known as a menswear, but originally started as a women's wear company, buying wholesale fabrics from local shops and creating designs. Um, and... His style was described as grunge, uh, and you can still see that today yeah. in, in a lot of his clothes. Um, and his goal was to let the clothes speak for themselves. So I know we've talked in the past about like Marc Jacobs going with that grunge look. His was even a darker... Like a deeper grunge. Yeah, like a deeper grunge, yeah. you know, dark colors. And um, and he originally went to Maxfield, LA, which is a boutique that's still in LA. Um, I found out about it through Fear of God, and I, I'm pretty sure I've been there a couple times. <laughs> when, when I was in LA... <laughs> When yeah. I was in LA, I didn't buy anything because I'm not balling like that. But um, yeah, he originally went to Maxfield in 1995 to try and sell him his clothes, uh, sell them. But the owner wasn't there, so he went to another boutique called Charles Gallet. I think that's how you say it. Do you know Gallet? what I'm saying? Yeah. Gallet? Yeah. yeah, Charles Gallet. Um, and he struck a deal with them. And he, they, they liked his design, so they bought him from him. But since he was so broke at the time, you know, he wasn't making money off of his clothes yet, mm-hmm. he got this deal with Charles Gallet to... Uh, the owner agreed to pay for half of the collection up front so that he could use that money to start designing his second collection. He was already in his head. He's designed his first collection, even though it wasn't yeah. sold anywhere. And he wanted to start designing his second collection. And so he struck this deal. Yeah, and Gale was was very influential, not even for Rick Owens and helping his brand get started. But also I know Gale was a huge retailer for Margella's first collection. Margella. Um, and I know that, I, that a lot of people say that Gale actually brought like Versace to LA Mm. and made that like popular there. I'm pretty pretty sure Gale was like in Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately in the future, like a little bit after all this happened, Gale ended up closing. So Rick Owens moved the majority of his LA stock to Maxfield after he was a little bit more established. Um, And Michelle Lamy would wear his clothes that he would design in her new cafe in LA. Um, the cafe was very popular. There would be a whole bunch of different uh, Hollywood names like Quentin Tarantino, the director, uh, Courtney Love. And actually with Courtney Love, she was actually super influential because she wanted one of uh, the skirts that Michelle Lamy was wearing um, mm. that Rick Owens designed. So that helped establish a relationship with all these different celebrities and sort of break into Hollywood. Crazy Courtney with Love. The, um, the influencers yeah. uh, uh, of sorts. Um, and his design studio was actually just across the street from 
Michelle Lemmy's ca- cafe. So oh, it was e- nice. easy to have people like get connected or get like connected. walk across the street if you wanted to visit and find out more. Most ideal situation um, right there. So uh, he eventually started to get more attention in fashion magazines and picked up even by Barney's New York in 1998. R.I.P. Um, Barney's closed down now. I know, just recently. <laughs> Um, but if you know about Barney's, it was a huge retailer um, and stock. He was stocked in the stores by 1999. My birth uh, year. Women really started to like his designs and quickly became a top, top seller. In 2001, he became uh, too big to create out of his L.A. studio and ended up getting a partnership with a distributor from Italy called. I'm not sure I'm going to say this right, <laughs> but it's like Io. Bochi Associati. That's pretty good. That's how I would say it. EBA. EBA. So we'll just call it EBA. For, for lack of better. Uh, and EBA allowed him to distribute his clothing on a larger scale. Uh, and he ended up moving to Italy for part of the year to work directly with the manufacturer. Oh, Paper notes. People. He ended up meeting Kate Moss while there and established mm. a relationship with her, which at the time Kate Moss was like the, the biggest the biggest model. model. Um, so she ended up wearing a Rick jacket. In a French Vogue shoot, mm. uh, which introduced Rick Owens to the broader fashion world in general, um, and really caught the attention of the the Vogue editor in chief, uh, Anna Wintour, and Anna ended Winter. up featuring him in American Vogue. So months later, Anna Wintour and American Vogue were looking to sponsor uh, different American designers, and ended up sponsoring Rick Owens for his first runway show in New York Fashion Week. However. 2001, unfortunately, 9-11 happened, which caused Rick Owens' first runway show to be postponed for a few years. Uh, Ended up going in fall, winter, 2002 to 2003. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of crazy how he caught the eye, you know, just through designing these things, through putting in this hard work, Mm -hmm. putting in his own money, and then getting noticed by, you know, he kind of works in tandem with Michelle Lamy his whole career. And yeah. Gets noticed by Anna Winter and, and you know, gets distributed yeah. to the larger I, scale. I feel like it also kind of shows how influential one person can be when developing your product. Right. Like, all you, he got rejected by Maxfield initially, and then, you know, Charles yeah. Gallet decided to take a chance with him, yeah. ended up elevating him. Kate Moss decided to take a chance, elevated him, and then the Vogue editor in chief, you know. Yeah, that's so huge. So that's, yeah, and I think it's important to point out too at this time that especially in LA, boutiques were huge in in lifting off brands, like lifting yeah. off their feet. Still are. So like one boutique could take a chance on someone, and that brand could you know to see right. where it is today. I know Maxfield took a chance on Fear of God and bought their product, and because Jerry Lorenzo says he was just hauling. You know, close to Maxfield, they took a chance on him and look where it is today. Yeah, and keep in mind too the the social context. There wasn't really social media at that time. Right. It wasn't as big. So right. for boutiques to no hold social media your um, designs in your work, that was really how people saw things. Especially in so, LA, a city where there's stars coming through with the most Hollywood, in- influential, most influential some people. Say. So. Um, so it was a huge chance they took on him, which ended yeah. up you know working out in his favor. Yeah, yeah, and so fast forward a little bit. Uh, after he was doing his women's wear uh, lines, he introduced his first menswear collection in spring summer of 2003, and this is what he's most known for today. Uh, a lot of his clothes he could see as sort of you know unisex in men or women wearing them, mm-hmm. but he's really known for his menswear uh, today, I would say. And so his first uh, runway show was spring summer 2003, and then at this time he also worked uh, went to work for. A, fur, a French fur company called Revion Frere. I think that's how you say it. Um, and this allowed him to work with luxury furs and kind of play around with designs with furs in his own collections as well. So he could kind of borrow some of those things and yeah. work with work those into his lines. Um, and so eventually at this time as well, uh, Rick Owens and Michelle Lamy decided to move to Paris in 2003, which is where they currently reside today. So he made the move from LA to Paris and they actually found like a five floor home uh yeah. to live in and it's really interesting. I actually found I'm I hope I'm getting the right title correct but it was actually used to be owned by like a former like French uh political official like mm. someone really high up. So they got that. Um, so yeah. he was obviously doing well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this five floor home is very interesting. So and I'm pretty sure it's where they still live today as well. Um mm-hmm. the first floor is 
for sales and is used as a showroom for his designs. The second floor is his office, Rick's office. Third floor is a studio space um, to, for him to design. The fourth and fifth floors are where uh, him and Michelle live. And yeah, they still live there today. Mm-hmm. And also at this time, he got into furniture design and it kind of spawned from a want to make cool furniture for his own home that he just moved into. Yeah. So it was kind of out of necessity, out of I want you know, these aesthetics that I have in my head to be played out. So we also got into furniture design um, and, and he still does that today and he has some very influential pieces. Um, and then while they were in Paris, I think in 2006, him and Michelle Lamy officially got married mm-hmm. um, and he opened his first boutique in Paris in 2006. And a really interesting thing is he actually put a wax figure of himself in that yeah. boutique. And that became a kind of trademark that in all of his boutiques around the world and wherever he, uh, yeah, wherever he's opened a store, he has some sort of figure of himself. Yeah. It's very like bent down as a table or like sitting yeah. as a chair. Very odd. And just strange honestly, things. a little scary. When I saw it, I was like, whoa. But um, yeah. he eventually left Revion, uh, that fur company, and he started his own fur company and it was called Palais, Palais Royale. Uh, which eventually he changed his names to Ulrich Owens. I don't know. But he started his own fur company because he's getting big and he wanted to be able to have more freedom in that. Um, and then also in 2005, he launched a women's line called Rick Owens Lilies um, mm. and a denim line called Dark Shadow. It's spelled D-R-K-S-H-D-W. Yeah, with all the vowels on. Right, with, yeah, you know, forget the vowels. And, uh, <laughs> and it became, and it eventually went on to become more of a diffusion line rather than strictly a denim line, sort of like a fog is to a fear of God yeah. or just a cheaper alternative um, to his main line. Still, yeah. you know, pretty pricey, but but a cheaper alternative. Um, and yeah, and so at this time, he's just branching out just from Rick Owens, created his own fur line, women's line, and diffusion yeah. line. Yeah, and the boutique ended up doing so well that in, in uh, 2008, he actually opened another store in uh, Manhattan, uh, another store in London, 2009, followed by other stores in Tokyo, Hong Kong, Seoul, Miami, Milan, and LA in 2015. Boom. And what's interesting is he still owns 80% of his brands today and never sold to a conglomerate. Uh, he actually started his cool. own fashion company called uh, Owens Corp, mm. which kind of covers you know all the different um, lines that he has. Mm. Um, but his... I think that's... Well, I yeah, just yeah, want to take it, a second to kind of... That's really big because think of all the brands today, like Louis Vuitton and, you know, yeah. Givenchy, Balmain, all these companies are owned by these conglomerates. We talked about it in our Louis Vuitton episode, like all these huge fashion houses are owned by two different companies, LVMH and Caring Group. Yeah. And they're these huge conglomerates, but he chose to never. Yeah. And, oh, wow. and the cool thing with that is that it gives him a lot of creative freedom to do things that he wants them. Right. Um, so he can make bold design decisions yeah. without getting flack from, you know, the board or the CEO yeah. or whatever, because yeah. he owns it. He's in it's control. It's like a private versus publicly right. traded company. Yeah. Right. Um, so with that, like Rick Owens, a lot of his influence from his design, uh, majority of his clothes are like all black. Right. Um, because he wants to focus on the silhouette of the clothes rather than the color. Um, he wants the shape to stand out a lot more. Yeah. Um, when he ended up launching his Dark Shadow line, it was more streetwear focused and oriented to appeal to those who like the streetwear aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Um, he launched important pieces that you can see being like mimicked and copied copied such as the geo basket sneaker Put them up here which um there's a whole interesting story about that yeah uh if you guys want to look into that in the creech cargos i hope i'm saying that right i'm pretty sure yeah it's creech which are like a wider legged cargos with extra long drawstrings um jerry lorenzo is actually accused of mimicking those designs i didn't i didn't um, want to believe it because i love them but um, then i was looking at it more and i was like ooh. But it, it makes sense considering a lot of their influence comes from the same place with, right. you know, Jerry Lorenzo doing like Metallica and yeah, like, a, like lot of, a lot of rock and punk influences. Same with like Rick, Owen, yeah. Rick Owens. Um, so it's interesting to see how that carries over. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And he also had created uh, cargo shorts with really wide legs, uh, which are also seen mimic in many streetwear brands. Also, Fear God kind of mimic those. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, other things, bomber jackets, skirt pants, denim. These are all made by Dark Shadow, his diffusion line. And the reason we're focusing so much on Dark Shadow is just because, like, as we said, it's not only more accessible, but it's also 
more streetwear based and what you right. see a lot of influencers wearing when they're talking about Rick Owens. Um, a lot of the time it, it's these, it's these things we'll put, yeah. we'll put pictures up so you can see them. Um, and yeah, just a little plug right now, since I said that, uh, if you're listening to this on Spotify, Apple music, make sure, or Apple podcasts, make sure to check out our YouTube, just yeah. a little, you know, plug in the big, because you're going to be able to see what we're talking about as we're yeah. talking about it. I think it just makes it more immersive, but, um, but yeah, and then he released the Geo Baskets in 2008, and he also designed the Ramones shoe. And these shoes popularized the kind of oversized, uh, high top yeah. shoe trend yeah. with the extended tongue. Yeah. Um, did it, you said there was like an interesting? Yeah. Well, the Geo Baskets and the Ramones. So the Ramones are influenced from the band, the Ramones, right? Um, like because Ramones. they wore like high top Chuck Taylors all the time and he wanted to make like his rendition of that. So yeah. that's sort of where that comes from. Uh, and the geo baskets, I want to say if I'm getting the right shoe, I know it's one of Rick Owens shoes, either the yeah. dunks or the geo baskets. Well, he turned the dunks into the geo baskets. Yeah. yeah. From, because he got influenced from the Jordan one. I right. wanted to create like a more extreme version of that. And yeah. he ended up, I believe getting a cease and desist, right? Yeah, he did. Which he is got, why it's, um, yeah. So yeah, such he, a popular item. He, I mean, it seems like we, it, we've we gotten the cease and desist. Like a lot of yeah. the companies we'd over, we've gone over like Supreme and some other ones have gotten cease and desist, but it actually helped them. Right. It's kind of funny. Cause yeah. So he, the geo baskets originally called the, the Rick Owens dunks took inspiration. As he said, from the Nike sneakers, they got a cease and desist cease and desist so we redesigned them and called them the geo baskets mm -hmm. but you can still kind of see it almost looks like a yeah. nike sign um the shape and, of the soul in general yeah right mm -hmm. right and another thing that's interesting too is he makes mainline versions of of these shoes that are like the rick owens um and they are made with more premium materials such as like calf's leather and all those really nice yeah. high quality materials and he also makes the dark shadow versions which are made with like neoprene um, canvas yeah. and you know just cheaper materials still nice still a nice shoe um, and yeah that extended tongue is just gave it a really unique look something mm -hmm. that wasn't really seen before and it's kind of playing back to the idea of from his childhood of where he liked that classical you know music that the classical literature but he also liked that more punk and rebellious yeah. so you can see it in his shoes you can see it in his clothes where he likes that classic Chuck Taylor that classic Jordan 1 but he wants to put his kind of rebellious twist right. on it. Right. Um, same with his clothes too. He has these extreme drop crotches. And if you don't know what drop crotch is, it's basically where the crotch or the middle of a pair of pants is way lower than it normally is. Yeah. Uh, or where your crotch actually is. Um, and that was mimicked so much in Fear of God in, in a ton of different companies. Yeah. Um, I want to say even like, um, what's that other company that makes the nice sweats? They've like done a collaboration with LeBron too. Do you know what I'm talking about? John Elliott. John Elliott. I'm pretty sure John yeah. Elliott does like drop uh, crotches too. And so, but he was kind of one of the those to originate the drop crotch. It's to such an extreme with extremely long drawstrings too. That's yeah. another thing. Is his pants and shorts had really long drawstrings almost to the knees, and that was huge with Fear of a God Fourth Collection too. So I'm not accusing Jerry of anything, but um, it's just interesting to see how how. Rick Owens has influenced Jerry Lorenzo even. Mm -hmm. um, and so he also has done many collaborations yeah. uh, with Adidas, uh, with Vejas. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. It's a shoe company. Um, Birkenstock. Um, They're like fur Birkenstocks. Fur Birkenstocks. Yeah. We'll put a picture up. But yeah, fur Birkenstocks. I've, I've seen them when Barney's was still open in San Francisco. I saw them before and I was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> interesting. But no, I do. Didn't a lot of his ever. designs are very influential uh, because he's so relies on shape and silhouette yeah. and not on color. Um, like we said, 80 to 90% of his clothes, even on the runway are black. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that most designers wouldn't be comfortable doing because it takes away all focus from color and puts it completely on the shape. And you have to be yeah. very confident in your designs to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and also his clothing and shoes have been worn by many pop culture stars and particularly loved by the rap world. Yeah, and I think this is sort of where he really gets introduced. I don't want to say into mainstream because a lot of people don't know him, but where he kind of is... To non-fashion. Right. To non-fascist. 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 Non -fascist. <laughs> to no. non-fashion. Um, subculture. Like, like yeah. the, the subculture right. is when he... Um, like. Is supported by all these famous uh, musicians and rap artists. Uh, he was first mentioned in rap songs by Jay Z and Rick Ross in 2010. Rick Ross. Uh, he was worn by Kanye, Lil Wayne, Usher, basically a lot of these like really big 
rap slash hip hop hip hop stars. Uh, ASAP Rocky uh, mentions Rick Owens a lot while he was first like getting established. Um, all of ASAP Mob heavily mentions Rick Owens. They all wear him. Uh, Kanye shows up to Rick Owens shows and furniture releases, different things like that. That's lit. Um, Have you ever been to a furniture release, Nick? No, never. You're trying to go to one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The what? IKEA off white. The IKEA off white. Uh, <laughs> Rick Owens, but that's cool though. It's that just it, him himself. I looked at. I actually figures. looked at some of the uh, furniture, and it is extremely expensive. Like you have like a stone seat that's carved out in a weird way that yeah. doesn't look comfortable, but it goes for a lot. And um, I don't know. It's cool that he doesn't just stay in clothes. But anyway, I just want the uh, wax Rick Owens table. Me too. That's what it wax is. Wax figure Rick Owens Imagine table. Imagine that in your living room. Yeah, that would scare everybody who enters your room. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Rick Owens is is a super interesting guy Mm -hmm. uh, himself. If you have any chance to kind of look up any interviews with him, I definitely recommend it. Um, One thing that he actually is big on outside of just design itself, which I guess maybe ties into design, it's actually fitness. Yeah, huge. Um, He actually says like the body is the most important aspect of your outfit and aesthetic. Yeah. Um, And he actually mentions in the... uh, Like he he has these rules of style. They're like 10 rules that, that are kind of like... That he advocates for. Yeah. Um, and developing like your style. So I think it's just interesting that, you know, why not read over it and share Let's with read you guys? We'll put them up on the screen too so you can yeah, yeah. read with them. Uh, so the first one he says is, I'm not good at subtly. If you're not going to subtlety. be sub- subtlety. subtlety, subtlety, I'm not good <laughs> at subtlety. Uh, if you're going to be discreet and quiet, then just, if you're, yeah, if you're not going to be discreet and quiet, then just go all the way and have the balls to shave off your eyebrows, bleach, do it. bleach your hair, put on some big bracelets. Let's do it. Uh, his second one, which I think is kind of like the most popular one that I've heard, uh, working out is modern couture. Mm. No outfit is going to make you look or feel as good as having a fit body. Buy less clothing and go to the gym instead. Ooh. Um, yeah, that's... Pay for that gym that membership, really, I guess. really popular. It's convicting. Um, his third one is, he said, I've lived in Paris for six years, and I'm sorry to say that the ugly American syndrome still exists. Sometimes you want to say, stop destroying the landscape with your outfit. Still, from a design standpoint, I'm tempted to redo the fanny pack. I look at it as a challenge. It's something fanny pack. to react against. Fourth one is, when a suit gets middle of the road, it kind of loses me. It has to be sharp and classic, almost 40s. You mm. know, drawing influence from his classical yeah. uh, background uh, his fifth one hair and shoes says it all everything in between is forgivable as long mm. as you keep it simple trying to talk with your clothing is passive aggressive dang um, dang he's yeah. going off I mean yeah I'll, I'll, I'll finish him off um, the sixth one there's something a little too chatterboxy about color right now I want black for its sharpness and punctuation what we've been talking yeah. about um, seven Jean-Michael Frank, the 30s interior and furniture designer, supposedly had 40 identical double-breasted gray flannel suits. He knew himself and is a wonderful example of restraint and extravagance. It's like Einstein wearing the same thing every day so he doesn't have to think. Yeah, interesting. Eight, I hate rings and bracelets on men. I'm not a fan (laughs) of man bags or girl bags either, or even sunglasses. I don't like fussy accessories. Isn't it more chic to be free? Every jacket I make has interior pockets big enough to store a book and a sandwich and a passport. Yeah. It's interesting because I know some jackets you can uh, wear as a bag that he has. They have oh, like wow. a little strap on the inside that you can wear. Dang, yeah. we'll try to find a picture fact, of those. Yeah. Um, nine. With layering, sometimes the more the better. When you layer a lot of black, you're like a walking Louis Nevelson sculpture, and that's pretty attractive. Allowing yourself to be vulnerable is also one of the most attractive things you can do. He's getting deep, just outside of clothing. Well, that's interesting too, because layering was so big when we were first getting into fashion, you know, having all these layers. 10, it's funny. Whenever someone talks about rules, I just want to break them. I recoil from the whole idea of rules. Right, after he establishes all his rules. He said, forget them all. I love that. Uh, I actually really like that list. Yeah, so it's interesting. I think kind of reading through also gives you an insight into what he believes and where his kind of guidelines for designing are. Yeah. Um, and I think the biggest thing is sort of like his emphasis on shape and silhouette over color. Yeah. Because I know a lot of people sort of, you know, when you think of putting together outfits. You can hide behind color sometimes. Yeah, a lot of people's first instinct is to like, okay, well, what colors, you know, match or fit the season? His is solely about shape, which yeah. I think is super In interesting. In honor of him, we wore black yeah so for you rick 
for you, Rick. Um, yeah, we figured what, moving on to our next segment, that's kind of like the general history of Rick Owens. Again, we are not experts um, in this field, so I encourage you to definitely do your own research because yes. um, I know there's so much that we missed um, because Rick Owens is just a person that is very in-depth and has a lot of layers to him himself. Yeah. His personality and clothing have a lot of layers. Um, so I encourage you to, to look up a little bit about about him and try to try to learn more. Um, comment below if you missed anything too, because I know there's a whole much, a whole bunch that we missed. So moving forward to our next segment, uh, where we go over wear uh, different share. outfits. We call it wear tear share. Wearing meaning that we like it, and we wear it. Tear like it. meaning that we don't like it. it's kind of trash. So that's not for us. Share meaning that it's it's cool, it's interesting, but it doesn't necessarily fit our personal style. So yep. we'll share it with someone else. Uh, so we thought again, what better outfits to go over than Rick Owens influence outfits? So Max, do you have your do yep. you have your two ready? I do. First one, I'm not gonna be able to tell you the exact pieces. I know he's wearing his own design clothing, but uh, check those out. Check that wow, out. The man we'll himself, it Rick Owens. It is Rick Owens himself. He's wearing again, true to his nature, all black sort of very fluffy flowy. like almost hammer pants kind of like flowy yeah. um i don't think those are geo baskets they don't look exactly no, like them so. but they're one of his shoes his high top shoes and yeah he's very jedi knight yeah i feel like um i'd Looks say like Anakin about to murder the padawans i don't know i'd say share i feel like it's too extreme for me i'm yeah. not i'm not as rebellious as you rick yeah so i'm honestly. also so gonna go with share. share i'm gonna go with share too because i like it but I don't, I don't think I could rock this. I would look like a sorcerer or like, um, what are those things in Harry Potter? The Dementor. Den- I look like a Dementor. <laughs> the Dementors. So I can't. Everywhere. But, but share. I appreciate it. This next one, Nick. Let, let me, this is from one of his runway shows. Oh, wow. Tell me what you think. So we got a ripped up, interesting shirt, shirt. with some very flowy pants, black pants with sort of like you buttons know? on them, I think. I, I'm actually gonna go share. That's surprising. Yeah, because that man is kind of buff. So I think that he, man makes it look good, right? Oh, oh, he looks like a different um, version of Rick Owens. So maybe if I was going to like swimming or something, yeah. like wear the shirt. Um, yes. The pants. I've actually seen those pants in really good outfits. So yeah, I'm actually cool. not against them, but I would not wear it personally. Okay. Um. So I'd go okay. share with that. I know that's a little surprising. No, no. I'm I'm gonna pull out again one of the things we only use very rarely: the pair, the pair, the rare <laughs> pair. Because this shirt, I don't think anybody should be wearing that. I mean, I don't even think it looks that good on that guy personally. But the pants are really cool. I. It reminds me of the fear. It reminds fear me of the God. fear of God side. Yeah. Pants kind of, but um, but I think if you paired those with a cool, maybe like sweater even like i don't know it doesn't seem like it would go but i think a cool like crew neck sweater or even just a, a trench coat maybe too i don't know just with a different uh, a layered upper with a shirt yeah. and a nice over jacket so i'm gonna pair that yeah yeah cool, cool. but the pants are very cool my my first outfit you yeah. ready boom oh the my man. goodness dave Chappelle. oh dang this is cool actually okay so he's wearing a very fitted this, shirt this is a uh, like his promo for his Netflix special. He's oh, yeah. He's wearing full Rick Owens. Okay. Very fitted shirt. The pants. The leather. It looks like leather pants. Um, and the Rick, those are the Ramones. Yep. Um, so I'm going to go. I'm actually going to go wear. Because although I won't make the shirt fitted, I think the shirt would actually look better if it wasn't as fitted on you. So I'm actually going to wear because I would venture and I would try something new. Because I really like the shoes. I like the pants. And I do like the shirt. So I'm going to go pair. I mean, wear. Sorry. Wear. Uh, yeah, I'd say where too. I feel like it's not too extreme as some of his other pieces. Where is this man? Um, no, no, he's just walking through, walking through the desert. Um, so I'd say where with this. I feel like it's again simple, relying on shape, yeah. but it's not too extreme of a shape that it's like avant-garde, right? Not wearable. Makes an um, artist. So that's what I'd say. Okay. Uh, my bad. second one is this. Oh, Michelle, <laughs> Lamy, and oh, and Rick. And, and Rick. Okay. So he's wearing... Focus on Rick. Focus yes, on Rick. yes. He's wearing one of those like tank tops that's very, very low cut, showing off his chest. A huge oversized jacket and gigantic, almost snow boot looking shoes with laces yeah. that wrap around the shoes a million times. And he's carrying some sort of groceries or something. I... Is that a gas station? I don't even know. I am going... And shorts. I'm going to go... 
I'm not tearing it because I really those shoes are not so interesting. It? The shoes there, are too interesting. Uh, pants that have that same design, like a jacket with also the strings. Um, I was trying to find a picture of someone wearing like the full fit, but I couldn't find it. It's almost like you know what? Wraps. I don't even care. Screw whatever people think. I'm going to wear <laughs> because listen, listen, because the shoes are going to be hard to wear. But imagine the shoes weren't there. It, this outfit would look really you cool. That, you wearing that low cut tank top? I will. I'll get buff for it. Just see. Hey, Working catch me. Catch, what is it? Catch me in a few weeks or catch me in a Holla few months. Me in six months. Holla at me in six months. And, and the shoes, I'll try them out. Why not? They're fun. And if we're going they don't look that hiking. good. But hey, I'm going to try them. So yeah, that's weird. I don't know. I'm getting bold today, I'd people. Say he inspired me to go bold. Tear. Tear. Okay. Michelle Lam Michelle Lamy's fit. That might be a wear. That looks, that's like just looks like comfortable. That. that looks comfortable. Yeah, it does. She has like a little blanket thing. She does, it. and some fur shoes. Some. But yeah, okay. Maybe. But I understand the tear. Yeah. I honestly understand it. That's That uh, does it for Wear, Tear, Share. That does it for Wear, Tear, Share. That does it for the episode. Make sure, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, leave a comment, subscribe. Um, and if you're listening to us, check out our YouTube and... Check out our Instagram, of course, right here. Boom, at Burnt Denim. <laughs> We're posting content. Remember, it's a community. We want your input. We don't want it to end with us. Um, so be looking out. We're also in the works, going to be collaborating with Torn and Warren in the future. So be looking out for that. But um, yeah, do you have anything to say? No. Just yeah. other than that, we love you guys. Thank we you guys you. for listening. We appreciate you. Couldn't do it without you. So until next time. Peace. Peace.